Hello, and welcome to Repro Film Festival by Mama Film. I am Debbie Samples. I'm Leela Meadow Connor. And I'm Mallory Martin. As the founders of Repro, we want to thank the village of people who have made this festival possible our filmmakers, special guests, partners, sponsors, and of course, our audience. You have lent your time, talents, and expertise to help amplify the voices that are so crucial in the fight for reproductive justice and bodily autonomy. When you purchase tickets and donate to Repro, you've become an active participant of change as all net ticket sales and accompanying donations support our five beneficiary organizations. We thank you for participating in these vitally important call to action conversations and hope you leave feeling empowered to be your own advocate in the world. Please keep women's reproductive rights at the forefront of your mind as we enter this critical election season. We're pleased to present the Policing Pregnancy Call to Action Conversation moderated by Cindy Suhu from the City University of New York's Human Rights and Gender Justice Clinic. Hi, um, happy Friday, everyone. Welcome to the Reproductive Film Festival's Policing Pregnancy Call to Action Conversation. Today, um, or this evening, we'll be looking at the growing system of laws that infringe, infringe on the bodily autonomy of pregnant women. I'm Cindy Suhu, I'm a professor at CUNY Law School, where I co-direct the Human Rights and Gender Justice Clinic. And I'm really thrilled to be moderating today's discussion about two amazing and really powerful films. Um, with, us, with us, we have an incredible group of people, Joe Artinger, who's the director of the feature documentary, Personhood, Rebecca Hamowitz, who is the director of the short documentary, 62 Days. Indra Wood Lacero, who is a staff attorney at National Advocates for Pregnant Women. Brianna Lipscomb, who's the senior manager of the Center for Reproductive Rights, um, Maternal Health and Human Rights Initiative. Um, and for you, for people who are out there watching and listening, uh, please, please, please feel free to uh, ask questions on the Q&A portal, and we'll try and um, do our best to try to integrate your, your questions through the conversation. Um, we're gonna start off by just um, asking a question to Rebecca and Joe, and maybe uh, Rebecca will start with you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you got involved and interested in the topics of, of your films um, and about telling these specific stories? Sure. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you to Mama Film and to everyone else who's involved for this. This is such a great online festival. I'm so glad to be a part of it. Um, I, uh, this particular film, I actually learned about it the same way a lot of people did in the subject matter in that I had heard on the news about Marlies Munoz. Um, and about the fact that her family all wanted her taken off of life support. She was 14 weeks pregnant at the time with an unviable fetus um, and that they were united in the fact that they did not want her to remain on mechanical support, that she had a DNR, which is very rare for a 33 year old woman. Um, but the state of Texas, was insisting uh, on interpreting a law a certain way so that she would have to main be maintained on mechanical support against their wishes. Um, I had never, I, I've worked on a lot of films before and they usually deal with reproductive justice issues with really complicated issues. We made a film about um, outsourcing surrogate mothers in India. I'm typically interested in films that aren't necessarily about um, something that's very obvious, but about something like sort of the gray area in where bodily autonomy and reproductive justice and all these other complicated issues merge. Uh, but Marlisa's story really stuck with me, mostly because I f was aware of how she was being sensationalized by the media at the time. Everything was a very black and white issue. It was either, do you want to save this baby or not? And uh, her family who were not remotely political people were really being dragged into essentially an abortion debate, the debate about um, you know, whether or not should they could terminate this pregnancy. But the important part is that Marlies didn't choose to terminate a pregnancy. She died when she was pregnant. Um, and the fact that she couldn't even be allowed to die because she was pregnant at that time just seemed so astounding to me. And I knew that there was a deeper story. Um, 
So I reached out to her family to get to actually answering your question. I reached out to her family and they were such lovely and really honest and um, shy and interesting people. It was not immediate that I ran out to film them. It was a series of many conversations and ultimately they felt that this was a way for their voices to be heard. And this was a way for them to share what was truly the most traumatic experience of their lives. Um, so once I began filming, it was clear to me that whatever, whatever did or didn't happen with this movie, I needed to make sure people saw it and could really get the full story about their experience. Um, so I'm really honored that I got to tell this story. Yeah, it, I mean, I think it was really a wonderful short film and it was great in terms of the focus on one family and, and their ordeal. And I think, Joe, you know, you kind of took a little bit of a different, you, you kind of had like three different stories that you wove together. I mean, and can you talk about what, what you're, you're thinking about and how you wanted to tell that story? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I had never heard of the personhood movement or fetal personhood um, before I started this film. And so once I started researching all of it and finding about out about how these laws were being used to, you know, target pregnant women, um, you know, I was kind of all in. And so I wanted, because I was pretty well versed in the issues, um, I thought I want to make a film that can help explain this to, you know, someone who knew nothing, like someone that was in my shoes before I started. And so I wanted to have Tammy as the focus of the personal story, but I thought it was really important to show people how these laws come into being in different parts of the country. You know, so with Tammy's story, we see how Wisconsin's law works. Uh, when we went to Colorado, we could see how personhood amendments, they get put on the ballot and they're asking the voters to make a decision. And in Tennessee, we were talking about the fetal assault law, which is something the legislature passed. And so, Everywhere you turn, there's an opportunity uh, for someone to pass one of these laws. And there are so many, they come in so many different um, stripes, I guess you'd say, um, that I think it's really important for people to understand just how widespread this is. Um, and that's been one of the most consistent pieces of feedback we get is that people are just really, really shocked. They, they can't believe a fetus could get an attorney. Uh, and, you know, they can't believe these laws exist, even in their own states that they consider are blue. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's what we were hoping to do. And we think it's coming across based on audience feedback. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it was really great also the way that you showed how it impacts family law, how it impacts criminal law, right, in terms of the, the Tennessee statute where they tried to make it um, a crime. Uh, for a woman to to use drugs while pregnant, um, and then just sort of that the broader personhood um, uh, ballot initiative. So I, I thought that was really great. Um, um, and and maybe I'll turn to Indra. And can you talk? Can you tell us a little bit about why you know what's the strategy behind these personhood laws? Like you know wh why is the why are anti-choice people trying to pass them? Um, and what, what broader impact do, do these laws have? Because I think what these films really show is it's not really just affecting people who want to terminate pregnancies, right? I mean, I think the big overarching goal is to push the question constitutionally so that Roe will be reviewed. Um, and frankly, it's been a very long-term strategic policy um, to chip away at abortion rights, hoping for the time that the court would be poised to reconsider Roe, um, which has been effective as we've seen, you know, the composition of the court has changed, the issues have been teed up. But I think even beyond that, it's been about, you know, a strategy for advancing um, conservative ideology and just it's been a um, useful tactic in a bigger context as well. And I think that, I think that's significant because so many of these laws and issues are not about what they appear to be about on the surface. You know, the, the law in Texas was not really about what it appeared to be about, which as the family so deeply came to experience, as Tammy so deeply came to experience, you know, these, 
these laws that appear to be about something, about protection of, you know, something, the fetus, ideals, <laughs> America, are so often not even about that thing. And I think even these personhood efforts are not even about fetuses. They're not even about concepts of personhood, but they're really part of, of a bigger political project to undermine actually some of these values. I could go on, but I mean, that's, yeah. that's a starting point. Well, maybe I'll, Brianna, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll turn to you and, and can you talk a little bit more about how um, these laws are really affecting pregnant people, people actually who intended to continue their pregnancies, how, their, how the laws are undermining maybe their health and, and their dignity. Um, and also about just, you know, the challenges actually that people face, pregnant people who actually want to continue their pregnancies. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think we, we, even with the story of Tammy in the, in the documentary where she talked about wanting to be transparent and honest with her provider so that she could get the care that she needed to make sure that any of her actions prior to did not have any sort of um, negative impacts on her baby. And then she was, um, you know, the, the response from, you know, the, the healthcare system and then, of course, the legal system was very different than the response that she anticipated and the response that she needed as someone that wanted to have um, a, a positive outcome to her pregnancy. And so what we see is that a lot of these laws are impacting the quality of care that's delivered because what you end up with is a healthcare system that's no more, no longer interested in delivering quality care and taking care of that birthing person and ultimately the baby, but they're siloed and they're the, so narrowly focused on um, just the, the, the fetus itself. And so um, when we're in, a, in the U.S., when we're so concerned about um, when we're having women that are dying at exponential rates, you know, from childbirth related issues. Um, and yet we're having laws that aren't being supportive of providing the quality care and the services that these women need. We're seeing this disconnect. Um, and so we, we saw it with Tammy and then Cherise underscored that with what's happening in, in what was happening in Tennessee, right? So uh, a law that was intended to help women in East Tennessee have access to um, substance use services ended up being a law that was negatively impacting Black people in Memphis. And so um, I, I think that somehow we continue to find ourselves in situations where um, the, the, the legislative action is not often lining up with what folks say they actually care about. And I think that we're just continuing to see that as we fight for maternal health and rights is trying to figure out why this disconnect seems to, to keep um, moving forward and how can we actually get laws in place that are addressing the underlying issues to this. So if the women are using substances during pregnancy, um, I think Cherie said it, others said it, they're self-medicating. They're trying to cope with the fact that Tammy didn't have access to um, health insurance to pay for the medication that she needed. Um, women birthing people that are in poverty, um, that are dealing with unemployment and just other issues that we could have the social supports in place if we wanted to, but instead the focus seems to be on implementing personhood laws um, and fetal assault laws. And so how do we stop that? Because it's imperative that we do. Um. Yeah, Indra, I'm seeing that you're kind of nodding along. I don't know whether you have anything to add in terms of like the, the kinds of strategies we're seeing and, 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 and you know, the, these laws and, um, and sort of this punitive approach, right? Just, you know, I'm, not, I'm nodding so passionately because I'm thinking of these women that I, I work with who are so resilient, so incredible for the things, the trauma, the the this profound despair that they experience but keep on keeping on and how much of a policy choice it is it's just a, it's just a choice we could make different choices choices that that really set out to help people meet them where they're at um it's not that it's out of reach it's not that it, these are impossible things um people people want to systems to help them. They believe in them when they go to them. 
Um, you know, most recently I've been in conversation with a woman in Northern California whose children have been removed um, due to substance use during pregnancy. She's here we are in the middle of COVID too. So she's not, she's having to FaceTime visit her infant and she is asking for help. She's trying to find help. She's in a rural area and there just isn't. There's not providers, there's not facilities. She would love to enroll herself in a treatment program where she could have her infant with her. And there isn't such a place for her. Even in the, you know, even in California where there's a lot of resources and there's some good progressive thinking. Um, but again, it's just about choices. And yeah. we're spending so much time and attention having to fight against these initiatives and even just clarify just from the depths. We care about families too. We actually care about pregnant people. We care right. about new life and new families. Let's yeah. turn some attention to that. Yeah, I think that that's that's really true. And I think, you know, Joe, one thing that was very powerful in personhood was the statistics, I think, that you showed that I think it was like 19 of 177 drug treatment, only 19 of like 177 drug treatment programs actually take pregnant women. Right. So this, right. I mean, do you want to talk about that? Uh, yeah, it's it's astounding to me. And I thought, you know, one of this crystallizing uh, pieces for me watching the legislative footage and, and this gets to what Brianna was talking about the legislator who uh, she's this is supposed to be oh this is for the families but on the other side she's saying these are the worst of the worst these women all they don't care about prenatal care that's so not true many women in Tennessee because they couldn't get help at a facility. And it, it, it was who took Medicaid, then it was who took pregnant women. And if they did take pregnant women, how many beds did they have? Two. So, you know, what would those outcomes have looked like if they had been able to get help? Instead, one woman afraid to be arrested gave birth on the side of the road trying to get to another state to give birth. You know, what would Tammy's outcome be, her long-term outcome be? Had she gotten compassionate care, services that she needed, instead of being traumatized by the state? And, um, you know, I, I mean, I, I could go on. I'm, it just makes me so furious. And I watched Rebecca's film uh, before this, and I had the same boiling emotions, um, listening to the people justifying this and the, just the dehumanization of women. And, and it's so, um, it's so upsetting. Uh, I, I cried good tears during the <laughs> Rebecca's filming. Yeah. And like a few expletives came out. I mean, it's just, why is it so hard for us to choose, you know, to, to do the right thing and provide services that would actually move people forward in life as opposed to moving them backwards by uh, putting them in jail? Yeah, yeah. And I, I want to give Rebecca a chance to jump in as well. And I, I just want to say that I, I actually also was really moved to tears and just, I, I mean, just in terms of what um, Marlise's family had to go through, it was just so horrible to see. Uh, yeah, no, and I, I, Joe, I didn't get a chance to tell you how I felt, clearly felt the same way watching your film, I, I, you know, it, it came up in this conversation earlier and a couple of the panelists mentioned it, right? What is the, what is the real point of these laws? Are they really intending to protect life or whatever it is they're claiming? Like, and it's very clear once you get to, to really examine anything with any, with any care, right? That this is not at all about protecting life. Uh, I mean, in the case of Marlies Munoz, right, there was no, this was not a viable pregnancy. There was no life to protect. Um, it's about creating a second class status for people with the capacity for pregnancy. And it's about controlling them. And the fact that every other person in the state of Texas gets to make a decision about what they want to happen to them at their end of life. The fact that a family can be united, we know what this person wanted, she was clear about her wishes, and yet 
the fact that she was pregnant at the moment of her death suddenly negates all that. And in Joe's film, there's so many obvious parallels. I mean, it, it, all these things are connected. Um, it just, I think it's so, it's like, I, I've, <laughs> I'm trying to think how to say this. I've been doing these discussions for a while and it's starting to get to the point where I'm like, it's so insidious. It's so clear to me that there is an effective method for people to discuss this that sounds very affirmative, that sounds like we're protecting life, that sounds like we're doing something positive, and its intent is completely the opposite. Its intent is so malicious and is so damaging to uh, not just to people with the capacity for pregnancy, but anyone who happens to love or care for someone who might be in that position as well that um, I think we need to reframe, like I just think we need to think about our language when we talk about these laws, myself as well, you know, that the, the, when we say things like fetal protection law, that's not accurate, that's not what they're really trying to do. Um, I think that, you know, personhood, I, it's so, um, it's, it's just so enraging because it's been effective for a certain, uh, goal. And I, I just think that the majority, I genuinely think that the majority of people, when they start to really hear human stories, when they start to hear how these laws affect real people or when they, God forbid, are affected themselves, don't want this. And yet it's framed in a way that people think they support it. So I, I think there's something in our discussion about how we change the script, change the language that needs to start happening even more. You, you said something important that I wanted to highlight, which was that the hospital made a decision to interpret the law in a particular way. Um, I think that that's important. Um, it shows the sort of extra legal impact that these laws, the, the um, efforts to change laws are having um, so that you can have a law written like Texas's, which wasn't great, but the hospital could have interpreted differently. The hospital actually had some choices that they could have made. But I think what, what I find is that people in those kinds of positions um, with some discretion who are um, part of systems um, in a role where they're having to interpret these things are, are influenced by um really the rights framing about these things so that there's this extra oh we have this is a thing this is a serious thing so we better be careful we better call in the lawyers we better not listen to the family <laughs> we we have to know kind of like we're an institution these decisions have to be made by institutions they can't be made by families uh, and that those decisions are, are where it's particularly insidious and, and concerning to me, uh, harder to get ahead of, you know, we can kind of at least grapple with the legislative efforts, the ballot measures, but having to go through all of the people are, who are in those discretionary positions and, you know, reframe and change right. the conversation. Right, right. I mean, it's interesting in terms of, um, uh, that, that hospital system, right? Because it seemed like, you know, the people who were running that the hospital where um, Marlise was, the, the more senior people were, were afraid of actually intervening to help the family, right? That, and um, I guess, and you had another doctor who was speaking, but she wasn't, she used to work at that healthcare system, right? But right. she was so pained by what was going on. Yeah, she, I can, I, I won't take up all the time talking about her, but she's such an interesting woman because uh, we always think about how, this is a little bit of a tangent, but we always think about how people are so fixed in their positions, particularly when we start talking about things like abortion rights or uh, anything that has to do with reproductive rights. Um, but here was a woman who the first time I met her felt it was very, very important for her to tell me how she was pro-life, that she was a pro-life physician. And that had she just heard about this law on paper, which she hadn't actually, but had she, she would have thought it was a great idea. And her experience seeing what happened to this family was actually really transformative. And she is now 
quite, you know, quite politically active against these laws um, for reproductive justice. I mean, it was a transition for her personally, but uh, at least one person I know has changed by this experience, I think more than one. Um, but I, but yeah, just to your question and to Indra's point as well, there is, there are sort of the, the gatekeepers as well that are involved because yes, these laws exist and then they get interpreted and reinterpreted and I am not a legal expert by any means, um, but it was very clear that the hospital could have quietly, easily, uncomplicatedly listened to this family and followed their wishes. There was no one opposing from the family, from the stakeholders and the people who were most involved um, and they chose not to. They chose to make a, a, a legal case out of this. And I think um, you, know, you can speculate as to why. There's probably more than one reason, but I do think that that's really important to acknowledge in terms of how these things kind of magnify, how they get made worse, and how they also could, on the flip side, in a good case, you know, could be um, simplified as well. Um, Brianna, I don't know whether you want to add anything in terms of the role of healthcare systems for, for good or ill in terms of trying to make sure that people have respectful um, and good care. Absolutely. I mean, I thought it was really interesting um, in the uh, 62 Days film watching, I mean, they talked about how it seemed that many of the physicians like intentionally documented in the case or in the um, hospital record that, you know, this is not what they would recommend and, you know, all of that. And, but I wonder, you know, how far did they go from an advocacy perspective to take it, you know, outside of just what they were documenting in the record, how much advocacy did they do with hospital leadership, with lawmakers, with whoever to really voice it outside of just what they were writing in their record. And so I think that, in order to have, you know, a true transformation of our healthcare system, um, we need all voices to come forward and take a stance on these issues. And so I think that's a key part is for, you know, providers to really step up and um, be supportive of our advocacy efforts to ensure quality care. Um, the other piece that I also wanted to touch on, I believe it was um, Rebecca that mentioned this, just about how careful we have to be about the language. And I think that it's been interesting um, over the past few years, just observing the co-optation of key civil rights, human rights, um, social justice language that antis have used. Um, against <laughs> efforts for to, to advance reproductive rights. Um, and so we've seen this obviously in legislative efforts. We've seen um, even in, I think the personhood film where the, um, the personhood activists had the audacity to compare their efforts to the abolition of slavery. Um, I can't even speak to how offensive that was to me personally. Um, and then even just thinking about current efforts by the administration um, to, you know, establish, you know, divisions within um, health and human services to have a civil rights area that's focused on <laughs> blocking access to care for LGBTQ um, communities and um, others that are seeking abortion and other attempts to establish commissions that will redefine um, civil and human rights. And so I think we have to be vigilant on so many fronts because um, I feel like there are so many attacks and using our own language against us um, that we really have to be careful about. So I just wanted to kind of address that as well as Rebecca mentioned, being careful about the language because what we think and what many of our advocates that aren't reading it closely may think is really advancing reproductive rights could be working directly against us. Yeah, I, I think that, that that's a great point. And I think it also ties back to Rebecca's earlier point about, um, you know, thinking about how these laws really play out, right? And, and, and I mean, I think both, you know, both films do, did such a good job of actually showing real people and how they're really, they're really impacted, you know, in ways that you might not expect and, you know, maybe changing people's minds. And um, I mean, and, and when I saw it, I, I thought you guys did a really great job also of just showing them 
as whole people in terms of Marlies and you know her work as an EMT and what a passionate person she was and a wonderful mother. And the same thing with, with Tammy, I mean, in terms of just what she went through and, and you know, the scenes with her and Harmonious and, and Dondi, I think are wonderful. Um, but, but I think it's, you know, it's not without cost for people to sort of be the main story in a film like this. But I think we get so much out of it, right? Because we actually see the individual stories and it has so much more of an impact. Um, maybe I'll just start with Joe. Can you talk about like why it was so important you know, for Tammy, because I, you know, I mean, she has so many other things going on her in her life. Like, why did she want to be involved in, in a film like this? And Rebecca, I'm going to ask you the same about um, Marlise's family. Yeah, I was introduced to Tammy um, by National Advocates for Pregnant Women. They had started working on her case. And uh, when they, when they broached the subject with her about whether or not she wanted to talk with me, um, she was very open to a phone call and she really asked me a lot of questions and she wanted to get to know me and she wanted to know what my purpose was. How did I intend this film to, you know, portray the issue? Because her driving force was no other woman should ever go through what I went through. And, and she, you know, her hope was that, you know, maybe this could impact the law in Wisconsin, but then beyond, you know, all these other stories that we hear. So for someone, you know, I once described Tammy as someone who's more comfortable pouring her feelings into a, one of her painting canvases than to, to speak in front of the camera and express herself. She did such an astounding job uh, telling her story and being open and honest. And it, it all comes back to the fact that she just never ever wanted to see this happen again. Um, and, you know, it, it's, you know, we've talked about this a little bit, but of course, people who are in need of services the most are typically the ones that are just getting scooped up into these, you know, laws. And, you know, that was another thing for Tammy and she really just needed help. And then the way it followed her around, I mean, Tammy has been amazing and we, we became pretty close, you know, over the course of years and several birthdays and, you know, doing the Women's March together, it was all incredible. Um, and so I've been able to see the long-term impact and, um, you know, it's no joke, you know, it stays with you and it follows you around. And so, you know, to this day, we just talked last week and she's extremely uh, interested in seeing this through, how else, you know, she wants to hear what's happening because she really would love you know, her case, actually, I mean, this is getting into the legal stuff, but you know, she was successful in her case and, you know, overturning um, or having that law declared unconstitutionally vague, yet it's still being applied. Um, I actually looked up some statistics, you know, because at the end of the film, I, I say how, um, how many women in Wisconsin have been affected over those years, but I didn't have access to 2018 figures. And I looked them up. And in 2018, over 400 uh, um, cases were referred for uh, potential unborn child abuse. They have an appendix in their report specifically for unborn child abuse. Uh, over 100 of those required further intervention, which we will not know what that is because it's all done in secret. And it also resulted in 30 children being taken out of the home. So they're ripping families apart it's still going on. And so it, the circling back to the motivation, you know, this is it, it's still going on, even after being declared unconstitutionally vague. It's not that they kind of stopped enforcing it. It's, it's, you know, maybe Rebecca, before we go back to you, let's go back to Indra to see maybe if you can give us an update about what's happening in Wisconsin. Like, you know, it is crazy in terms of there, there was a decision that it was on, a, from a lower court that it was unconstitutional. And then the, the, um, uh, the appeals court said that the, the decision was moot because she didn't have standing, really a technicality that really didn't undermine the legal reasoning. But, and so it's so, so absurd that this law is still in effect. So can you talk about what's going on um, in Wisconsin? Yeah, so essentially the, the law goes on um, and they're, allowed to go on because there was you know it was kind of like the case wasn't tied up with a bow 
Um, ideally, we would have to find another plaintiff in order to move the issue further. Um, the standing issue, I think, is, is another one that is particularly relevant to, to pregnancy-related cases. Um, basically, the court has rules about what issues can come before it, and if an issue is short-term or resolved before the court can, can deal with it, then it's considered moot. Um, and pregnancy is a time-bounded thing. So it's just this other way where the, the issue of pregnancy is challenging to bring before the, the courts. Um, are, are there any legislative, um, uh, are people trying to sort of legislatively overturn it? Um, there's, st there's strong organizing efforts and we have an organizer that's working in Wisconsin to raise awareness. I I'm actually not aware of an actual bill that's that's currently active. Mm -hmm. I may I may be wrong, but um, that that could sometimes the legislative option is quicker than the courts mm -hmm. um, to get final decisions in the courts takes a long time, and then you have the standing issue as well. So, um, well, let's, Rebecca, let's go back to to Marlise's situation, and and maybe you could t take us back and sort of talk about what it was like for you working with her her family and. Um, you know, why they wanted to do the, the film with you. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I'm gonna forever be grateful to this family for opening their life to me during what was the most traumatic experience they've been through. Um, you know, it's not easy to do that. And I think from the, from the get-go, from our early conversations, her family really, similarly what, to what Joe was saying, um, they did not want this to happen again um they wanted to be able to really express what they experienced and what they went through because there was so much misleading information and there was so much misinformation um in the case of eric munoz marlisa's husband uh he and this was not a person who wanted to be in the spotlight by any means that i think he felt that he wanted to honor his wife's wishes and part of that was to explain what had really happened um and also there's a you know it's it's tough to relive these moments again and again and to testify again and again and for some people the the sacrifice of like opening yourself up to a documentary film is that now this this document exists, you said it, it's out there and it can hopefully continue to make an impact long after you've told your story. This can continue to tell your story. Um, her parents and her mother, Lynn Machado, are, uh, she's so dedicated to this. She has testified every time different iterations of this law have come up. It's been three times now. It's gonna keep coming up because they're not giving up on trying to change the law. She has testified um, at the House of Representatives in Texas. Uh, I think that it, it's a true commitment to trying to make something out of a tragedy and really also to trying to, uh, to have your voice be heard. You know, as a documentary filmmaker, you hope that the film you make can make a real impact. Um, and I, I, I think that the families who participate in this, that's their goal as well. Um, it's, it's funny, actually, I just, I'm just seeing on the chat that we, I think that- um, That Lynn that, is with us. Yeah, that Lynn is, is, is on. And, oh, I thought she might be on. Yeah, and I'm I, so I, happy to see that. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I just have to say like her, Lynn, your, like your strength, it was just, it was just so, so touching and, and I, I think your family is so, so strong. And, um, but I, she, she wrote that um, in response to the question about the doctors and the situation with the doctors and, and she wrote um, the doctors at the hospital were told that if they went public with their remarks and feelings, um, that, uh, they ran the risk of not only losing their jobs, but their medical license. It's interesting in terms of like the mm. way that we sort of set up these, these systems, right. In terms of the doctors feeling like if they actually treated their patients with respect and, you know, consistent with medical ethics, right, that they would lose their license. But 
Yeah, I feel if the, I, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I feel the doctors assigned to Marlies's case were acting as advocates in the best way they could, albeit not losing their jobs or licenses. The doctors were absolutely against the procedures being done to our deceased daughter. Yeah, and I, I Lynn, I'm so glad you're with us. I can't, you know, she can say it better than I can, but if I can speak to that just a little bit on her behalf, um, you, you see it in the film as well. Like the doctors were told quite clearly that they, that they had to, and this is what's so interesting about so many of these laws. I mean, this came up in Joe's film as well, right? It's not about best medical practices. It's not about science or treating patients, right? It's, it's very much politicized. So these doctors who were forced uh, to, to, to do things that they thought were morally wrong or not uh, viable or not helpful, uh, they were told, first of all, very clearly that they had to behave a certain way or they could lose their job. Um, once I was filming, they were told they could not speak to me or they may lose their jobs. Um, some of them did off the records, but I, but I respected their wishes for that. It was only really later that we discovered those comments put into the medical records, which is not a comment. I've talked to a lot of physicians since then. It's not common to put those kinds of notes and they were doing what they could to try to let their voices be heard. Um, I will say that someone who was the person who was the head of obstetrics of OBGYN at the JPS hospital when this happened to Marlies Munoz, who couldn't talk to me at the time, is now the chief medical officer of Planned Parenthood in Texas. So someone else was impacted by this horrible thing. Uh, and I, I think it's been one of my goals as a filmmaker to get this film to doctors, physicians, medical students, PAs. I mean, these are the people who actually are faced with having to behave in a way that isn't even necessarily ethical to them, that's against what they want to do. But, you know, these so-called laws are then instructing them that they have to behave a certain way. So I'm glad that Lynn brought that up in the chat. And as she said, you know, they, she's really, really committed, her family's so committed to making sure this doesn't happen again and to changing the law in Texas. So I would thank them. Um, thank, yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you, Lynn. Um, we, we're, we have a few questions on the chat. And so I'm going to make sure that we get to those. Um, the first question is, are there any states that have passed legislation that would provide free prenatal care to women who are pregnant and who want to help with issues of addiction. And, and so maybe Brianna or Indra, you can talk about what, what care is available. Yeah, I don't know. Things yeah, absolutely. Them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I'll, I don't know if there are any states that have specifically passed legislation to provide free prenatal care for um, folks that are um, dealing with um, substance use issues. Um, however, especially if they're not um, eligible for pregnancy Medicaid. So I feel like a lot of the efforts in states are really contingent on whether or not the birthing people already qualify for um, assistance in a very particular way. I think there have been a few efforts to expand the services or even extend services that are available. So um, I think right now there is a lot of attention on um, services for women that are um, battling issues with opioid use during pregnancy. And so we have certainly seen a significant increase in um, programs and access to treatment services, um, both during pregnancy and then also postpartum. Um, and in fact, I know Missouri passed um, legislation to extend their Medicaid coverage for women that are specifically dealing with, I think, both mental health and substance use issues. Um, so that is positive. We would love to see that extension of care um, for any person that's on pregnancy Medicaid, you know, up to one year that they not just carve it out for, um, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, a smaller subset of the population because we feel like all of these people um, need help. And then also, um, I think the other question is around, um, you know, perhaps what if there's an issue that's undiagnosed at that time and then um, they don't know about it until after that, you know, uh, 60 days of coverage lapses. So, um, so there are some efforts, but I certainly, I don't think that 
the efforts are going far enough just yet. Indra, you may have other thoughts. I mean, I was, it's, it's hard if you don't understand the landscape of maternity care to appreciate how, how sort of starved it's been. I mean, if you're from the West, like I am, you can sort of just know what a parched landscape is like. And some of these, some of these policy, policy changes are good, but they're happening in the context of a parched landscape. You know, it's like watering a desert. Uh, you know, oh, y yes, <laughs> bring the water, but it's just, we need so much more. Um, so it's possible for people to get connected with services in places where there are services, but still these, these programs aren't solving for the lack of just providers, the lack of infrastructure. Um, so it's, it's a complex sort of not, but it has to do with, again, policy priorities. You know, the whole system has been built around and reinforced around the, what, the health of the fetus and then the infant newborn, even the timing of postpartum care delivery. Um, so there's lots of pieces that make that, it's, it's not enough just to, just to pass laws that say we wanna make sure that pregnant people who um, can qualify for free care. Right, and it goes back to, I mean, I feel like Joe, in, in Tammy's case, right, she, the whole, her whole problem began with the fact that she didn't have um, medical care, general, general medical care with her yes. thyroid problem, right? Good, good point. Yeah, and she tried. I mean, she did her due diligence. Uh, she was told there'd be this long wait. And, you know, she'd also been told that she, it was unlikely she could get pregnant because of the severity of her disease. And so, you know, she went about um, self-medicating and, you know, was quite surprised to become pregnant. You know, she really found it hard to believe. And so um, she immediately went to seek help. And so it's just, it is, you know, we've used this word a few times tonight. It's so insidious that you have someone doing all the right things trying to access the services. Um, you know, I have the mildest thyroid disease. I can't even imagine what it would be like to have a level uh, of Tammy's that was off the chart. I don't even know how she could even move. So it's just really a shame that we've decided as a society that we need to focus on punishing people um, and, and not focus on providing care. Yeah. Um, we, so we, ha we have about 12 minutes left. I, I, we have another question. Of, people are asking about the status of personhood laws. Someone specifically, I think, from Massachusetts wanted to know if there were any kind of efforts there. But maybe if Joe or Indra or, or, or Brian, if any of you know, like, you know, are there current personhood efforts in different states that people should be looking out for? S similar to Colorado, I, I think that was the question. Do you want to answer that intro or? I'm not tracking all of the efforts. Um, I know there are ongoing efforts and, and similarly insidious. So Colorado, for example, has, has had personhood ballot measures. And this year for the first time we have a 22 week abortion ban ballot measure. Um, so I know whatever your state is, I don't totally know what Massachusetts situation is. But I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say they take on different forms. Yeah, so yeah. See these abortion bans, what they really are doing there is codifying the personhood of the fetus from conception in that law. So it, you know, if personhood measures fail because people might not be able to swallow that, then let's call it something else. And we saw that in Colorado where they said, oh, now let's make it about this terrible tragedy that happened to a pregnant woman. So, you know, there's the terrible tragedy, they pass a law, and then they use it against pregnant women. And so we see that it's, it's just called something else, um, but it, it doesn't matter, there's this, that patchwork of laws that establishes the personhood of the fetus. And yes. once you do that, women have, they lose their personhood. I guess what I'd note from National Advocates for Pregnant Women's work, um, tracking cases all over the country is that almost every state has had a case where, where a woman has been criminalized because of the outcome of her pregnancy, but for the pregnancy, there would be no crime. Uh, so I know for sure that Massachusetts is one of those states. And again, it's because 
regardless of the law, there's always the possibility that can be interpreted in a particularly punishing way or a particularly punitive way. And that's what you, that's kind of what you have to look out for. And that's, I guess, what I would hope that advocates could come to be as adaptive or as, you know, cued into the squirminess of these issues so that you can catch them no matter what the language is or no, no matter how it's phrased and that we can become a little more, you know, leery of these laws, regardless of what the wording is. Yeah, well, I mean, I think one great thing, uh, you know, in uh, personhood was just um, the movement in Colorado uh, organized by, led by Color and other groups, right, to sort of beat back this pers personhood legislation. Um, and, you know, which I, and I think it, it was a, hard, it sounded like it was a hard campaign in, in terms of getting people to understand it what the, the law is really doing, but like there's sort of these long-term efforts to get people to understand and be more savvy to see what the impacts are going to be. Um, and also um, in Tennessee, right, that they were able to repeal the fetal assault law. Um, and I just, so maybe I wanted to turn it to, to talking about sort of organizing um, and what's going on in terms of, of getting voters out, getting people educated, um, and I feel like a lot of this work is really being led by reproductive justice groups and, and women of color. So I don't know if people want to talk about, about what they're sort of seeing in terms of the organizing. Uh, maybe, I mean, oh, Indra, you, or well, just, well, well, maybe let Brianna chime in first and then we'll Sure. So um, I, I think, so I'm based in Atlanta, Georgia, and I can't help but think about um, the six week abortion ban that came down in, um, seems so long ago, it was either 2018 or 2019. I feel like we're constantly battling this, these issues. So you just never quite remember which year it is. But um, so of course that six week ban, definitely dealing with personhood issues. Meanwhile, Georgia has practically the worst um, maternal mortality rate in the US. And so um, a lot of the organizing efforts that we've been doing here while trying to simultaneously ensure that women still have access to um, the full spectrum of reproductive services is also trying to um, you know, demand that the government actually pass supportive laws for um, maternal health care. And so, um, I think part of that is making sure that we're supporting our partners on the ground as they are really the first line of defense that we have because as I think Sharice was a, a great advocate in the um, in the film just talking about you know realizing these are the negative implications that these types of laws will have. And so I think making sure that we're engaging our partners and amplifying the work that they're doing, listening to them um, as these types of laws are coming down and also figuring out how we can um, change what's already in place is really critical. Um, I think the other thing that I wanted to um, lift up is rethinking the this entangled relationship that the healthcare system has with the legal system. Um, because as we've said many times um, during this discussion today is it's impacting the quality of care. It's impacting the trust that patients are able to have with their providers. And so the result is either they won't seek care or when they do seek care, suddenly they're um, thrust into this justice system, whether it be the penal system, whether it's um, child protective services, and I'm using quotes there, um, you know, there, there's just this really um, dysfunctional relationship. And so I, I feel like we have to figure out how to separate the two so that when a person needs care, they're able to go to a place where they can trust that the, themselves, them as an individual, regardless of their pregnancy status, are able to receive the care that they, um, that they need and that they deserve without fear um, that there will be some sort of legal action against them or their families. Um, and so those are just some of the issues that I feel like are constantly ongoing and that we are at the center um, through our work on the maternal health um, front are really trying to make sure that we're walking in solidarity with many of our reproductive justice partners as we're fighting these, um, these issues. Um, well, I would just want to, to emphasize that that 
disentangling of healthcare from policing essentially wouldn't even it doesn't even have to be hard there are great pathways and roadmaps and they're just due process and they're just things like informed consent and privacy laws that actually these systems can do they effectuate these principles and laws um, often with other patients um, but on complex issues some of those procedures and principles break down um, with regard to organizing i just wanted to mention i think one of the amazing insights of women of color with regard to reproductive justice is the intersectionality of these issues. And I think when we are very rooted in the intersectionality, we can win. Um, so one, one of the approaches that Colora is taking in Colorado now with regard to this 22 week abortion ban is talking to communities about how it's an access, access issue. Um, with regard to abortion on the one hand, but it's similar to how the Colorado legislature considered pandemic relief that would have included undocumented immigrants because they too have lack of access to needed health care. And it's about making sure that communities have access to, to needed resources so that they can thrive. That's a message that really resonates and that's, I think, the great wisdom of the reproductive justice movement and the women of color leaders is just remembering to root the root our efforts in family and what's good for families. Yeah. Um, all right. So, wow. It, um, the time has just like flown by. Uh, we, I think we ha have three minutes left. I mean, maybe we can take a few more minutes, but I want to maybe give each of you a chance to to see if there, you have any closing remarks or sort of any kind of call to action for, for people um, as they, they um, leave this, conf this space in this conversation. Um, and maybe Rebecca, maybe I'll start with you. Sure, I, yeah, and there's been so much interesting conversation. I clearly could just keep talking for a while, but I won't do that. Um, as far as a call to action, I mean, I was thinking just now about what Brianna was saying about the entanglement between the legal system and the health system. And there's sort of this, this other actor, which are uh, the politicians who are creating these laws who, and I've spoken to many of these people and who don't care about, they, they, they not only do they not really care about sort of the, the nuances of the health care, they, they don't care to inform themselves about basic biology when it comes to what is possible and not in a pregnancy. I mean, I wish I was joking, but it's like, they literally are living in a fantasy world where once a, a sperm and an egg have met, then somehow there is a, this magical thing that's going to happen that doesn't involve a, a pregnant person. And, and at any rate, um, uh, I think that we can vote I think that these the people who are making these laws that are then complicating these uh, uh, these very um, factual and medically based health issues, um, the people who are actually creating these laws aren't required to know what they're talking about to make you know to create them. They just need to get the votes right. So I do think that um, that it's certainly true with what's gone on in Texas, and it, it's true. All across the country, I think that um, we need to hold to vote and hold our leaders accountable. Uh, that would be a good, a consistent place to put our efforts. Oh wait, and Rebecca, before I, I leave you, is there any update with Marlisa's law? Um, there's there isn't a huge update. So uh, in the end of the film, you saw that the law at the time of, at the end of the filmmaking was left pending. That was almost six years ago, which is crazy. It has now had three iterations because in Texas, their, uh, their House of Representatives only meets every two years. There's only in session for six months every two years. This is what I learned making this film. Um, and in the, those three sessions that have happened, there has been a different iteration of this law. And each time it has advanced a little bit further, which is incrementally good. It is just requires the patience of everyone involved and including the family members who have every right to be impatient. Um, but the, the law has moved a little bit further in that it went to committee. The second time it was voted out of committee, I hope I'm not getting this mixed up. Um, it has never gone to a full vote. 
but that's probably next. So there are advocates in Texas who will continue to fight for this. It's also inspired um, advocates and lawmakers in other states who have heard about what happened to Marlies, who are in Iowa, for example, who are, who are trying to change these laws. It's a slow process, um, but hopefully, you know, it is, it is moving very slowly in the right direction. It's not something we can kind of assume will correct itself. It takes a, work, a, a lot of hard work from a lot of people. Thanks. Um, all right, um, Joe, any um, last words? Well, yeah, of course, what Rebecca said, voting is so important because th these laws are made locally. But, you know, also building off of what Brianna and, and Drew were talking about, uh, it's the coalitions that have the success. When you build a broad coalition across, you know, legal groups, medical groups, reproductive justice orgs, you know, you're, there's strength there. And, and we've seen that, um, and likewise, I guess, let me, because this is the important part for me, is just, we need to look at this issue in a much bigger view than abortion. And so, um, you know, those coalitions with different emphasis, they, they should, they can all come together and this has to be looked at from this broader view. So the nurse or the doctor in uh, Rebecca's film, um, you know, she identified as pro-life, but she just can't get behind what happened. Uh, I was contacted by a woman who saw the film and said, I was the person who went to the pro March for Life uh, rallies every year. Uh, the film opened my eyes to what can happen. So if you can pull the issue back out of just this silo of abortion, and if we can all start talking about these issues in that broader sense, uh, then I think we'll have more success because nobody wants to see, well, very few people want to see this happen. Some people are happy to see this kind of thing happen. But I, I'd say that, you know, you can make a lot of headway, you know, and just by changing the way we talk about it, trying to get the media to talk about it differently so that we're not just stuck in this uh, abortion, you know, we're on the opposite sides here, you know, of the fence. And what can we rally behind? And that's what I love about this festival is that it's covering such a broad range of experiences that people face. Right, and, and we're, we need to center real, real women and, and real people. Um, yes. Um, uh, Indra. Well, that's even, that was one of the things I was going to say. Um, Sorry. <laughs> building on what you were saying, Rebecca, on these issues, so many basic scientific facts are disregarded. Um, you know, just simple questions. Is this fetus viable? Does this person actually have a substance use disorder? What kind of treatment would actually be helpful? Very basic issues are quite often just ignored or handled incompletely. So science matters is one of the things, but also science is culture. And the questions that we ask are informed by assumptions that we have. Sometimes those are white supremacist assumptions or sexist assumptions. So with regard to even data and what we know, I, I encourage people to think about the questions we're asking and you know, vote for people who ask questions, who are curious, who are willing to talk to people who have different life experiences and as yourself to seek different life experiences, talk to people with different life experiences because that will help us understand the framing of science and, and what truth is and where it comes from. Um, Brianna, you have the, the last word. Yeah, so I mean, I echo everything that everyone else has said, and I think um, just taking it a step further, what we've been trying to do with the Maternal Health and Rights Initiative within the center is really do a focus on proactive policy. So while we've been trying to battle many of these negative policies, um, is recognizing that <laughs> there seems to be um, a willful ignorance around what type of support would actually be beneficial to um, pregnant um, and parenting folks. Um, and so really organizing and um, 
you know, getting collaborative efforts to advance proactive policies that will put in place the types of social support services and other um, things that, that parents need. And so um, I think the call to action across the board is just making sure that folks have access to the full spectrum um, of services. Well, thank you. Well, I, I want to thank you guys. I, I feel like I could be uh, here with you all night. Um, so I just want to really want to thank you for, um, for all your wisdom and for your wonderful films and for the amazing work that, that Brianna and Indra are doing. Um, I want to thank the audience for participating in this call of action, call to action. Um, and for recap of the organizations you can support around this topic, um, you should go to visit day three on the repro website. Um, and also think about uh, continuing to support the film festival by purchasing uh, film tickets and attending more call to action conversations. Uh, you can get full information uh, at repromamafilm.org. Uh, and don't forget that all the ticket sales will actually be donated uh, to reproductive justice organizations. So um, thank you guys. And thank you um, Repro Film Festival for, for bringing us together. Thank you so, thank you so much. Thank you.